Well, good morning, Walden Church. Welcome to Sunday morning. This is going to be a really special time because we are going to be having our communion Sunday today. It is the first Sunday of the month, and we haven't observed communion since this whole pandemic started. And so I think we've been missing it, missing it physically, missing it spiritually. And so we decided we would take this morning to observe this practice. And so right at the beginning, well, let me just say, uh, you might want to pause this video. You might want to go and find something that you can use to represent the body and the blood of Christ and go get uh, some bread, some crackers, get a wafer, uh, go get a little thing of juice or something that you can drink, some wine maybe, uh, and we're gonna have a little communion service together today, okay? On the night that Jesus was crucified, he and his 12 disciples went into the upper room to observe the Passover meal together and it's actually from this day from this moment forward, all through the course of human history, that this practice would change. And the eternal destiny of every Christian who believes in Jesus Christ as the resurrected Son of God would also change. The Bible records in Matthew 26, now as they were eating, Jesus took bread and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Now, as this passage begins, it says, Now as they were eating, Jesus took bread. And that would make us ask, Well, what kind of bread? What kind of bread is this? We know that it is unleavened bread because it's the type of bread that was used for the Passover feast. In fact, there's no other bread anywhere in all Judea at this moment. Generations earlier, the law of Moses had commanded that on the 14th day of Nisan, that you would purge all the leaven, purge all the yeast from the house of every Hebrew. And everybody did it. It was a strict law. In fact, if you didn't do it, and you were found to have leaven in your house, you could be cut off from the entire nation. 1 Corinthians 5 says, Your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Cleanse out the old leaven that you may be a new lump, as you really are unleavened. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Let us, therefore, celebrate the festival, not with the old leaven, the leaven of malice and evil, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. You know, Jesus even referred to himself as being the bread of life. He gives us life so that we might live. And if we are to receive him, if we take him as our bread of life, then we humble ourselves before him. Plus, this is also uh, used, unleavened bread is also used for another reason, because yeast is a symbol for something that gets inside something else and, and corrupts it. Why is that? We don't think of uh, nice, big, fluffy bread as being corrupted, right? Most of us like nice, big, soft, fluffy bread. Well, it's because leaven is something that can actually cause fermentation. It can cause spoilage. If you introduce leaven into a wholesome substance like bread dough or juice and you leave it unchecked, it can go sour. It can become a smelly product that you wouldn't want to eat eat. It's unfit for eating. It's unfit for drinking. So this is why it becomes this symbol of what sin does in our life if left unchecked. So the first step, the first observance in communion is just that, just what we see the early Hebrews do. As they clean their homes, we purge our heart. We look inward and we take a look at our sin and we confess that sin to Jesus who is the savior of our soul. And so it's through the repentance of sin, the receiving of the bread of life that we are made ready. Next, in Matthew 26, it says, as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it. Jesus blesses the bread. No Hebrew would ever consider eating a meal without first offering their thanks to God. This blessing is then provided for the entire meal. 
This is where you and I get the tradition of saying grace before we eat. So we enter into communion and we confess our sin and we give thanks and we adopt this with a grateful heart. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him would not perish but have eternal life. And when the ancient practice of Passover was given and they took the Passover bread by Jewish custom, they would say, Blessed be thou, our God, King of the universe, who brings forth bread out of the earth. And so we recognize that it's only because of God's love, it's only because of his grace, it's only because of his mercy that we are given the greatest gift, which is salvation through Jesus Christ. And it's only right then that we continually offer thanks, that we look inward at the sin in our life and we give thanks for the goodness and the grace that's been given to us. Verse 26 says, as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and broke it. So after the prayer, Jesus broke the bread. See, when bread doesn't have any leaven in it, you don't need a knife. <laughs> you don't need a cutting board. Unleavened bread snaps in half. Unleavened bread is very brittle. It's very thin. And so the breaking of the bread is Jesus signifying the woundedness, the piercedness that he would receive on the cross, that his body would be broken for us. Isaiah 53 says, Surely he has borne our grief and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. You see, when we take communion, we recognize that Jesus was broken and that his suffering on the cross was for us. Now as they were eating, Jesus took bread and after blessing it, broke it, he then gave it. He gave it to the disciples. Jesus was broken on the cross for each of us, but we cannot receive him into our lives until we recognize that his body was given to us, given to us personally. I, I cannot, and, and neither can any living person on this earth, give salvation to you. Yes, I'm a minister, I'm a pastor, I'm ordained. God is the only one that hears your prayers. God is the only one worthy of hearing your prayers. God is the only one who hears the cries of your heart. And he gave his son to you. So if we receive Christ, if we receive him as the bread of life, then we allow his spirit to come into each one of us, one at a time, and make us right. I cannot make your relationship right with God. Only God can do that. Jesus then says, this is my body. And if you notice, if you look at the timeline of events in this story, when Jesus says this, there's probably nothing even in his hands. He, he says this after he has given the bread away. The disciples have it in their hands or they have eaten it. So we understand that when Jesus says, this is my body, these words are symbols. When Jesus says the wine is his blood, he is saying this as a symbol. The bread is a symbol of his body. The wine is a symbol of his blood. We observe this ordinance. We observe this sacrifice that Jesus gave through symbol but we don't believe them to be anything more than that. It says he took the cup and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Jesus then takes the cup and he gives thanks and he tells his disciples to drink it. The cup is also a symbol of the suffering and the blood that he would shed on the cross. Why? Why Jesus' blood? Or why any blood, for that matter? Hebrews 9.22 says, Indeed, under the law, almost everything is purified with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. See, without the blood, 
my sin can't be washed away. Without the blood, I cannot be made whiter than snow. Without the blood, there is no atonement. Without the blood, I have no hope. So yes, our faith can be graphic, our faith can be bloody at times, but we don't shy away for it, just like we don't shy away from our own sin. In, in the communion observance, I don't pretend that my sin is not there, and at the same time, we don't pretend that the blood is not there. If it wasn't for the broken body of Jesus that brought me salvation, if it wasn't for the stripes that were on my Savior's back, if it wasn't even for the cross itself, there would be no grace. There would be no salvation. There would be no peace. If, if any cross could have saved me, then any person could have died on it. If any wound could have saved me, then any prisoner could have bore it. If any broken body could save me, then I could just claim any accident victim to be my redeemer. If any of these things could save me, then I could save myself. I could take all the glory for it. No, it's only the blood of the perfect sacrifice. It's only the blood of the perfect lamb. It's only the blood of the Son of God that saves me and nothing else. Nobody can duplicate perfect, sacrificial blood. Nobody can claim to have any part in saving themselves. Ephesians 1 says, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. This is why when I take communion, everything's gone. Every little scrap of bread is gone. When I take that cup, I drink it until it's completely dry. I want to receive all of Christ. I want the blood of atonement to wash through me completely. I don't want to leave any sin or any brokenness or any darkness in my heart. I would say, Lord Jesus, clean me and make me whole. Let me be seen as perfect in your eyes. I want to I want God to only see me through the blood of the Lamb. And Jesus gives thanks for the cup, just like I am thankful for the blood that is shed. I thank God for sending his Son to die for me. I thank God that he loved me even when I was unlovable, even when I was far away. I'm thankful that God showed mercy to me even when I did not deserve it. I thank God for the bread. I thank God for the cup, for the body that was broken, for the blood that was shed, for the atonement that has led to my salvation. Why do we do this? Why do we take these elements? Why do we practice this? Why do we observe this? because Jesus told us to. 1 Corinthians 11 finishes with Jesus' words. He says, do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Communion is a church ordinance. It's one of the two commands that Jesus instructs his church to practice. And the other one, is baptism. And just like how I cannot live without food and without drink, this use of bread and wine in the Lord's Supper is to remind me that I also cannot live without the death and the resurrection of Jesus. So today as we take this bread and we take this cup, we should be thinking, we should be thankful for the presence of Christ in our life, for the work that was done by him and him alone on the cross. I want you to take what you have as your representation of the bread, of the body of Christ. And we're going to pray together, and then you will take it when we finish. Let's pray. 
Lord Jesus, we come before you in humility. And we ask that you examine our heart today. Show us anything that is not pleasing to you. Reveal any secret pride, any unconfessed sin, any rebellion, any unforgiveness that may be hindering our relationship with you. Thank you that we are your beloved child, that we have received the gift of life and have accepted your death as the penalty for our sin, the price that your son paid, the price that covers us for all time. May we each day live for you. And so as we take this bread, representing your life that was given for me, we remember and celebrate your faithfulness and to all who receive you. Yet you took that pain for each one. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for your extravagant love. Thank you for your unmerited favor. Thank you that your death gives us life, abundant life, now and forever. Amen. The body of Christ given for you, take and eat. And now uh, take up what you have that represents the blood of Christ, the cup. We'll pray together, and then once we pray, you will take that as well. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, as we take this cup, representing your blood poured out from a splintered cross, we realize that you were the supreme sacrifice for all sin, past, present, future. And it's because of your blood shed for the world, your body that was given freely, now we can all be free from the power and from the penalty of sin. Thank you for your victory over death. And you took that death that we all deserved. You took our punishment. Your pain was indeed our gain. And today we remember, we celebrate this precious gift of life that you give us through the blood. Amen. The blood of Christ given for you, take and drink. Well, thank you for taking part in our communion celebration today. Um, you may be able to head over to Facebook and watch some of the worship that took place today, or you and the people that are in the house with you could burst out into any worship song uh, that you all knew together. The scriptures say that when the disciples left the house, they went out singing. And so it is also a tradition during Passover, during communion, to sing songs, to sing praises to God for the cross and for the love and the grace that he gives us each and every day. Thank you for hanging out with us for this communion moment, and we look forward to seeing you guys again soon. Thanks. I love you guys.